So there was uh, three of us, um, and basically we all graduated from Ryerson University. There were three partners, uh, Matt Bishop, Blair Powers, and myself. Uh, we uh, enjoyed our time in school, but I think we were unprepared for what was going to come after uh, we graduated. We all wanted to start a production company. We wanted to do dark dramas, uh, comedies, and then soon realized that we had no experience and no one was going to take a chance on us. So I ended up working at a talent agency, um, which is, I would say, you know, unless there's agents here, one of the lowest rungs of the industry, uh, in that I was having to call out auditions for people where I was literally like, you are the before in the before and after photo, try to look as disgusting as possible, and they were like, we can do it, we can do it. Blair, who is uh, my best friend, he was working at um, a post house where he would literally log video footage, uh, they were doing industrial videos, he was working in this guy's basement in Burlington, and they would log industrial videos of uh, medical videos, so he, logged every day 10 hours of proctology videos, so cameras inside people, day in and day out, to the point where Blair could tell the difference inside. So he's like, oh, that's Isabel. No problem, there's a cyst right there. So it was kind of, kind of gross. Um, but that's when we started our company. To give you a sense of how inexperienced we were, this is our first corporate profile shot. There's the three of us. <laughs> we thought, you know, it went with the name Sinking Ship. There's Blair in the yellow, uh, Matt in the blue. Um, so while I was working at this talent agency, I think it was making $350 a week, So I, and I had $25,000 in student debt, so bad. Broke up with my girlfriend of five years. It was just the lowest, darkest time of my life. Uh, and then one day, this kid named Daniel Cook came into the uh, building. Uh, and the agent knew Daniel's parents and, and thought that he was amazing. He was five. Uh, and they're like, you know, this kid uh, is spectacular. So they left him down with me while they went up to talk about business. And I can only imagine what he saw, because I was just like hunched over, waiting to die. Uh, and he came over and he's talking to me about Transformers, and I'll always remember he said that he liked Decepticons more than Autobots because they were more interesting characters. And so it was like this little bright moment, uh, and I was, you know, just enjoying the conversation for like 20 minutes. The agent came down, and he's like, you know, this kid deserves his own show, which truthfully the agent had said about anyone that moved through that office. But it was the first time that I thought about if I were to do a kid show, what would it be? And I jotted down the idea for Mrs. Daniel Cook, which was literally just following around this five-year-old and seeing how he experienced the world. Like, it was the simplest thing. Uh, so I called Blair at lunch, and I was like, Blair, you know, I have this idea for this show. Do you think we should shoot a pilot for it? And Blair was like, I'm looking inside someone right now. Yes, we should. I think this was the other shot that we sent out. That's <laughs> so. Daniel 
Daniel Cook was started. And now, one of the things that I think uh, differentiates ThinkingShift from some of the other companies out there is that we do our own development in-house, and we put our money up. So we shoot pilots for everything. It's a way for us to test the concept, but it's a way, I think, also to respect the person that you're pitching to. Everyone that you present has to pitch it up to other committees. They're going to show it to their kids. To think that people are going to do that with a script, I think is a little bit crazy. We're in the TV industry. We should show it. Uh, and also, I think about like this show, if I had pitched, if I had gone in with no experience and said, oh my gosh, I've got this great idea for the show, about this really hilarious five-year-old who's gonna touch your soul, they would be like, I have heard that from everyone. So I'm gonna show you a little bit. This is from the original pilot that we shot in 2002. Are you gonna give it a shot? You wanna eat that one? Okay. This is Daniel Cook eating chuckles. <laughs> Good. And do you know what else is very good with chocolate? Is tea. Oh. Yeah. And you know what? What? Um, it's not just tea that's good with chocolate. It's also milk. Um, when you're making chocolate cookies, it's good with milk. Milk and chocolate is very good together. Sometimes after you've eaten a nice chocolate truffle, it's good to wash it down with a big glass of milk. It was very nice. Very nice working with you. Thank you so much for helping me out this morning. You're welcome. You <laughs> <laughs> went to Oprah eventually. Um, so what was cool about that show is that no one else had thought to do it, and I and I think this is where I got the first lesson for Sinking Ship, which was you know partly that our inexperience. <laughs> was our greatest asset, that by not going to other companies and learning how they've done it, we tried things differently. So when I shot with him, there were things he liked, there were things he didn't like. I left in the things he didn't like because I thought it was entertaining. Not knowing that in kids TV at that point, they dare not touch that kids have negative emotions. Like they've just never seen it. But because it was done in this way, not as like, you know, animated, farm animals talking about why they're upset about something, but an actual kid feel it, not that those are bad shows, I'm sure they're good, uh, it's just not the kind of shows that we make, sorry, well, that's gone, all right, uh, but uh, no, but it's, it's that it's from a real kid and a real kid's perspective, and so I think seeing that, it, it made it acceptable, and that goes into a lot of our shows, I think we learned in this one to be as honest as we possibly could with the audience, and we, we're, lucky, we're lucky because we do a lot of live action, so we have real kids there that will tell us if it's wrong. So uh, with this show, yeah, it aired in 2004. Uh, while we were waiting for it to go, I should say, when it was picked up, uh, we sent that pilot out to everyone. TVO called the next day uh, and said, you know, they were interested. And our, when we were at Ryerson, you know, they were like, at that point, professors were like, you know, they may never call, they may never get an answer, it won't happen. And then we got this phone call, but we had no idea what to do. We obviously all quit our jobs, expecting to be shooting the next day, not knowing that it takes a year to finance. So then we were like waitering, like it was there was another dark period of time. But what we also did then was shoot pilots for new ideas. Um, and as Daniel Cook uh, went out, it was picked up by Disney uh, in the U.S., which is like, as we all know, you know, the light of God raining down on you when a U.S. network sees you. Uh, but as soon as Disney picked up the show, all of our other pilots that were in contention got picked up by various networks. So that show uh, was the first English preschool series to be dubbed in Germany ever. So the first live action preschool show. And again, it was just that they said that they had never seen anything as honest as that. Um, it sold to over 120 territories, which, you know, for a live action show, we got told all the time that live action kid shows don't travel well. As you will see by the next couple slides, that's just fake. Um, and then it won lots of prizes. Um, so, which brings us two years later, so 2006. This is when we basically took everything that we learned from Daniel Cook and started to incorporate into our other shows. But at the same time, we realized that we were still looked upon as people that were making live action interstitial preschool programming. So those are five minute episodes. That's all we had done. To start pitching greater, we had to figure out ways to make ourselves look more impressive. Uh, and so one of them was, uh, I wanted to do a kids travel show. Now obviously a kids travel TV show had been pitched a thousand times. We obviously chose to shoot a pilot, but none of us, those three people that you saw on the beach in ripped clothes, had ever left the country before. Uh, so that was one hit. So it was about stepping back and being like, okay, well, what, what is the network going to ask? And the first thing, if I was pitching a TV show and I was the network, I'd be like, why you? In fact, I think that's what they ask about everything. Why you? Like, what possible reason do I have to trust you with children in foreign countries, right? All we have is Daniel Cook and Blair's experience in proctology videos. Uh, that doesn't sound good either. 
or don't tweet that. But um, <laughs> so so we elected to shoot a pilot. We're like, okay, well, who would be the best name to get on board for a travel series, right? And that would be National Geographic, right? And why not reach out to them and say, listen, we've done this other show. What do you think about? us to taking that format and moving it internationally. Uh, at the same time, I was worried that networks would be like, okay, well, if you're going to third world nations, what makes you credible? You don't have an international degree in development. So I was like, oh, you know, the next person that would be great, that would be UNICEF. Uh, so we went to National Geographic and we started to talk to them. I may have mentioned that UNICEF was more interested than they were at the time uh, and said the same to UNICEF, but whatever <laughs> happened, they both came on board relatively at the same time, and thank God those organizations do not talk to each other. Uh, but we ended up going in with a, a series that was had a pilot shot in Mexico, uh, uh, National Geographic on board, and UNICEF. That shoot was a nightmare. The pilot shoot, we actually had executives from National Geographic come down, which is the most stressful moment. We had arranged, has anyone been to those pyramids in Chichen Itza? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're gorgeous, right? And so we took uh, two Canadian kids, siblings, an eight and a six year old, set them up for this beautiful moment because the one thing that I love shooting is kids' first reaction to seeing something. Like there's nothing more beautiful in the world. So we had them kind of blindfolded, they're standing, we've got the pyramid behind them, we'd set up these shots so that all they have to do is like open their eyes, turn around and see this pyramid and we were going to capture all that. Six executives from National Geographic standing nervously. Uh, I called the moment, those kids turned and the look on their faces is one of the best, like it's, it's still, it's so amazing, they're just like, oh. and then immediately after that they're like, a lizard, <laughs> and they run out of the shop, right, following this lizard, and I'm there being like, oh, look at the natural children, this is amazing, right, this is all part of the plan, thank God that lizard made its way back to the pyramid, and that there was lizard iconography all over that pyramid, so it actually, those stories dovetail, but what, again, what we realized is like, let them kind of choose the path, that is what a kid would do, if I tried to, and I was trying to make an episode out of the pyramid, because you think pyramids are going to be interesting, but truthfully, that lizard was cooler, and they could hold it, and they could talk about it, they could go to the pyramid. So it was about kind of adapting to what our kids were telling us, our focus research being literally right there on set. Um, this is, so 2006, we've grown to 18 crew members. We added post-production, uh, just because we realized that we spent a lot of time in post, searching for those moments, and trying to work with editors that weren't just racing through it, but actually trying to find where was the heart and soul of the show. Uh, so this is the trailer for Are We There Yet? World's Adventure.
for you. Thank you. There's a little bit of an over there yet, so that was partnership with Ashley Graf from UNICEF. Uh, we filmed in more countries than any other kids' series that we can tell. I'm not exactly sure how to prove that, but from what we can find from other shows, we're going to lay claim to that. And sold to over 90 territories. And this show does something that I particularly love. I, you know, I'm uh, clearly not the biggest fan of animation, especially when it comes to certain educational things. Uh, for me, it's if you're going to try to get kids excited about the real world, it is important that you show them the real world and not necessarily from the perspective of some animal in the animated world. Although I'm sure that can work as well. Um, the one thing that I should say that it, in looking back at, at what we wanted to be in, in terms of this discoverability is that we were also pitching shows that we could do, right? This is Daniel Cook. The total budget for that series was I think 600,000 which was for 13 half hours of content. You know, it wasn't such a big ask that people weren't going to give us the freedom to do that and to be in the roles that we wanted to do. I directed every episode of that because I had directed the pilot so I could speak to the relationship that I had with that kid. I, we were not out there pitching a feature film and expecting that to be our first pickup, though we did get there eventually. Uh, and then even for Are We There, yeah, uh, that was a $1.2 million series and we went to 10 countries in the beginning. We stayed in horrible places. Um, but we were able to afford it and, you know, got a lot of life stories out of it. Um, 2008. So this is adding script to reality. So after we'd done a lot of uh, reality series, we were, you know, interested in certainly pushing the boundaries. I think we, at that point, we'd done maybe seven shows that were all uh, reality-based, and we wanted to see if we could take the philosophy of what we were getting in the reality stuff, which was off the cuff things that sounded honest, and see if we could dovetail it into uh, scripted. We'd grown to 35 crew members at that point. We'd added interactive. And again, you know, this was mostly to have more control. We found that when we were working with outside companies, sharing an assets took forever. To be able to consolidate everything into one place meant that the quality was better, our teams were more inspired, and more people were talking and trying to figure out cool ways. This is an updated corporate shot that we took in 2008, six years later. We're not in tattered clothes. There is an admiral. Uh, and we pitched Dino Dan. <laughs> so Dino Dan was a series. Um, it, it actually goes back to Daniel Cook. So Daniel Cook uh, did 130 five-minute episodes. Each one he tried a different career. When I met Daniel, he said he wanted to be a paleontologist at five uh, because he liked that uh, grown-ups, uh, in paleontology, grown-ups hadn't discovered everything yet. And I thought that was interesting because it still left a place for him to figure things out. After 130 episodes where he did every possible career, he still wanted to be a paleontologist. And that, that same reasoning was that, you know, you could still discover things. So he was like, you know, your next show should be about dinosaurs. And the thing that I always try to do is, you know, mold that idea and try to figure out how do you present something that no one has ever seen before. I do not understand, you know, at, at the core of discoverability is just, you know, have a reason to be discovered. Like, be different enough, be compelling and original, and they will find you. If you go out, not, I'm going to go on animation one more time, but with, you know, a pitching a farm show with animals that talk about caring and sharing, there are a lot of those shows. Why do that? If you're going to be innovative and push it to some frontier that no one's ever seen or animated and it's the most beautiful thing, but if not, you are treading in the same water as everyone else. When we hear networks ask, you know, or tell us what they're looking for, we pitch the exact opposite because they will get bored of seeing what they think they were looking for and then be surprised by like, oh, maybe we should try this crazy thing. Look how cool we are. Not that they move like that, but I imagine in those boardrooms there's a moment where they're like, maybe we gotta change our whole strategy. And you've got that pitch that didn't follow what they want because if people knew how to make a hit show, there would be far more hit shows. Uh, so, so this series was about going back to what I think kids liked about dinosaurs, and when we asked kids, they were like, we like them because they're scary, right? Every single one. Now, there was like 1% that was like, I do not like them because they are scary, but you cannot play to the 1%, and I think that is actually true, another little point, which I'm just realizing now, but you can't, you know, if you try to make it for all audiences, it will just go into that, you know, milieu that doesn't stand out because it's kind of boring and plain. This was about saying that no dinosaurs were big creatures, they would fight each other, they would try to kill each other. We do not show death on the show, but we get extremely close. Um, and so again, it was about showing, well, okay, well, what's that going to be for kids? How are you gonna uh, show that? And in pitching it, because we knew we were gonna shoot a pilot, it's stepping back and being like, what were those questions going to be? Obviously, what's the, what's the relationship between the lead character and the dinosaurs? And can you pull off the animation because you're competing with Jurassic Park? So this is just a, a bit of the demo that we shot in 2000,
if you're stoned. <laughs> months and you're up and running. <laughs> Not that everyone's bitter. This is just a taste of about any time. Ten minutes? Ten minutes, okay. Uh, this is just a taste of what the actual show became. This is me, Dan Henderson. I'm a regular kid. I have a brother, a mom. I'll arrest him later, okay? A dog. I go to school where I have some really funny friends. And some interesting teachers. You know, you know, very prehistoric. There are no piggyback rides in gym class. And I have a really cool hobby. Dino Experiment 116, Dino Experiment 105, Dino Experiment 103. A Corinthosaurus! Spinosaurus! A Quintosaurus! You see, I love dinosaurs. I can call myself Dino. Um, you know, so we were lucky to get some uh, pretty notable Canadians in there. There was Andrea Martin, we got a lot of the kids in the hall. Um, you know, I'm surprised that those people don't pop up in more shows. When I asked them why, it's they were like, nobody asks us or think that, thinks that we would be interested. So they all came out at like reasonable rates. Uh, but that show uh, we produced, it took uh, about a year to make. It debuted as the highest rated uh, premiere on Nick Jr. in 2010. Uh, it sold to over 140 territories. And it spun off two additional series, including the one that we're shooting yesterday, uh, which is Dino Dana, which is the first girl spinoff. Um, 2011, uh, this is bringing in a So some of the animation in there that you could see was great, but we had a lot of fights with the animation company because they would say to us, and this is the kiss of death in working with certainly Sinking Ship, they're like, you're pushing too hard on the animation, you're trying to do too much. Uh, you need to realize that this is just a kid show. And I think that attitude actually permeates that people don't realize that the kids' industry, what we're actually making, has more viewership than any adult primetime show ever by a ton. And we'll talk about that in, in, if I have time in a second. We got the 75 crew members. We brought animation in-house. People said that that would be ridiculously challenging, but we knew that it would be the only way that we could guarantee that the quality of that animation was going to be spectacular. And so I think being able to get control over your properties and how you make them is one of the steps that you can make sure that those things are going to stand out because no one's going to push as hard for your series or your idea as you are. Uh, Down and Down and Trek's Adventures was the series that came out of that. Hopefully you can already see that the animation is significantly better. That's so me. Skip it because it's, we got to keep coming. Um, that sold to over 160 territories. We actually bested our last one, and we won the Emmy Award for Outstanding Preschool Series. This is one of the best moments of my life. This happened last year. Uh, we were up against Sesame Street. Sesame Street and Sesame Workshop has never lost the preschool category since that award was created in like 1986. The looks on their faces. They were shocked. I think we were equally shocked. We had pre-drank because we thought we were going to lose. And so our speech is not the greatest thing ever, but it was still such a glorious moment. And it shows that something that's innovative and has a unique take and is different can take out, you know, a juggernaut like Sesame. <laughs> we don't need a lot, obviously. Uh, not today, that's currently in production. Uh, oh, and we average 1.1 million views per week on YouTube because it's dinosaurs and obviously kids like that. There's Dino Dana, the little girl we shot in a submarine. They fight a megalodon in the first episode and almost die. 
Uh, growing up, so then we decided that obviously we were pushing the preschool for a long time, so we wanted to go a little bit older. Um, and we got to distribution, we added Androids, one of my favorite shows. Uh, so Androids, we were at a conference where they were talking about how girls are underrepresented in kids' TV. Uh, in live action shows, girls only represent one out of every three characters. In animation, they're only one out of every four. And I was like, oh, that's not a problem. I was working on a kid show with a little boy, because I think you write to your own, uh, to speak to your younger self, maybe, I think. Um, and I was like, oh, we'll just switch it to a girl. Won't be a problem. So we did that. We shot a pilot. We showed it to all of the US networks. And we were rejected by all of them. Um, mo and some were very overt that they're like, uh, we would take this. We love the concept. But we'll only take it if you change her to a male lead. Uh, because we believe that girls will watch boys and girls, and boys won't watch a girl-led show or something crazy. Um, you know, so we're lucky at sinking shit because we're nothing if not petulant and angry, and we're like, well, we'll find another way to make it. So we took this pilot and we showed it around the world. I have to say, too, there's also a genderless android character that they make in the pilot episode, um, Pal, who's kind of discovering what it is to be a kid. Uh, we took that all around the world and found the money elsewhere. So it's also like if you have something original and different and you feel is ahead of its time, there will be people that say no. Those people are not right, and you, it's your job to prove them wrong. Um, so we went around the world, we got Germany on board, French Canada, and SVT in Sweden. Uh, they were my favorite, oh shoot, they were my favorite because they were, um, when they saw Pal, they're like, we love the gay android. Who was <laughs> 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 he going to end up with Ad or Nick? <laughs> it was amazing. Um, this is a little taste of some of the things that happen in androids. I said it's impolite to spy on people. You're a girl? You're a boy? Obviously. Do you live here? This is my laboratory. It's where I do my research and some of my experiments. What experiment is underneath this sheet? This is Pal. This is awesome. So, where is he? Who? Pal, you said to be here at 0800 so we could all spend his first day together. What makes you think Pal's a he? And do you see a socket wrench? I don't know. Isn't he a uh, he? We'll have to ask Pal after Pal wakes up. I didn't program Pal to be a boy or a girl. Cool. Cool. So, and I've got a little bit of the trailer from season three. Uh, so I just have to say, so Amazon came into existence around this time. I think it was 10 years, or not the company, but uh, going into TV. And they uh, specifically wanted things that were risky that no one else wanted. And so we were two weeks into pre-production and they came on board, which was obviously you know, a, a challenge, but awesome. Uh, but it took the creation of an entire new network for this show to find a home in the US. This is currently what's going on. Barbed wire, metal doors. What do you think she's trying to say? Stay up. What's going on? Kids programming should look like, which was the best compliment because it was dealing with issues 
that kids are actually dealing with in their lives. Kids are interested in talking about themselves and figuring out gender. and it, They hear all these things, but no one actually talks to them. I think when we find that kids are watching up, it's because we're literally talking down to them. They're watching older series because those series are actually compelling to their real world. They are far more sophisticated than we give them credit for. Um, 2014, we are growing. We added audio post-production and brought us to Odd Squad, which is uh, probably our most successful series in the States. I don't know if you guys have seen this show. Um, I'm gonna talk over it. This was a series that had two LA uh, creators. It went to PBS, and PBS, though, they passed on androids because it had too much action. Um, loved that the animation that we had done. So they decided uh, when, that, when that content came to them, they brought that series to us to say, you know, would you be able to do this? And I love, you know, for us it was taking a concept that was brilliant, the writing was spectacular, but it was originally set in an uh, office environment. It was kind of described as like your mom's office environment. So it was meant to be pretty staid, pretty boring. We had, you know, it's a spy show. So what we did was work with the writers to upgrade the vision. We built a 50,000 square foot set that's completely interconnected so we could move from one zone to the other. We added tube systems and gadgets and just went like 100 times bigger. Uh, and, and it was because, you know, for the, from their perspective, everyone had told them no, it would be impossible. Other production companies that they had met who would obviously love to shoot in an office environment that they could rent cheaply. It is not easy to build a 50,000 square foot set, but if you want to stand out, you have to take this risk. If you look at what your competition is around the world, we're not just competing in Canada. The benchmark for success cannot be just having a show. It has to be, does that show carry? Does it go around the world? And that takes time, that takes effort, that takes stepping back and being like, how do we make sure that this looks and feels like nothing else that's out there? And I hope you get a sense from looking at the stuff that we make that it doesn't look and feel like what's out there. So it's easy to pitch. If you go to MIP, if you go to Kids Screen and you go up and down those aisles, you will see like, oh look, it's Knights this year or Dragons or something and everyone's chasing one another versus having something that's, that's different. I think about Degrassi as a prime example of a series and you know, I love them for it. But Degrassi is, is just an honest show. It's one of the number one Canadian exports for content because it's honest. Why there aren't more people chasing Degrassi blows my mind. Uh, we're going to try to do that soon. So yes, very successful, does some stuff. Oh, average is 50 million monthly video views. Uh, that series airs on Amazon, Netflix, and PBS. 50 million, like that's just a ridiculous amount when you think that sometimes we tout Canadian successes of series that are like, it gets 260,000. Uh, see that? I'm just going to show uh, scaling up. So I'm just going to show you a little teaser of the movie, uh, which technically you're not supposed to talk about, so you did not see this here. Don't no, put it on the tweet that I showed you. I'm just wondering. 
Yeah. What percentage of your pilots are self-financed? Are they completely self-financed? All of them. All and of them. we are one for one for every pilot we've shot uh, has been picked up. Now, we did shoot one pilot a couple years ago that was uh, like a Ghostbusters themed thing. And just when we were about to present it, I saw that two other Ghostbusters shows, uh, type ghost shows came out or were being pitched. So we pulled that back because I just, I don't want to be known as like the copycat or chasing someone else. So, but yeah, everything we've shot, now that means that we spend a great deal of time making sure, like internally it's a far harder audience to impress inside Sinking Ship than anywhere else. But by having those teams like VFX and Interactive, they are all excited too. So they're pitching ideas and concepts and technology that influences it. So it's just, you know, it's just making sure that you don't hit the market with something that looks yeah. So for that uh, pilot you showed us um, with the partnership between UNICEF and National Geographic, that was after you guys produced that demo in-house? No, so we uh, brought them on board mm -hmm. based on our uh, working on, this is Daniel Cook, and them kind of believing they were both, you know, interested. Uh, and then we used them, helped uh, finance the money with them to go and shoot. So they put up some of that money. But we did not charge fees. We did not charge anything, so our time was free. And you know, you have to know, like, you know, we're working our way up, we're clawing our way up this ladder. We're finally at features, but we will still do our own development because it gives us the utmost control. As soon as you accept a development deal from a network, they have complete control of it. If they wake up and they're like, "Oh, this would be great if there was a raccoon in it," you have to be like, "Oh, that sounds interesting. Let's explore that." <laughs> Versus holding that back, showing it to everyone, having them say, you know, find the network that actually believes in it, and then working with them to make something. Incredible. Okay, great, thank you. Hello. within our own corporation. And I kind of love how the creative that we work on influences us as well as the audience, one hopes. Um, so one of the first things we did was we balanced out our post teams. They were all men. Uh, that was easy. It was just seeking out women. That The, the two uh, women we hired were nominated for an Emmy Award for their uh, editing work on Odd Squad. And then in the directing chair, it's something horrific, like the DGC, I think it's third. 15%, 16% of the members are women. It's a, it's, a, it's a sad low number, and honestly, there's no real excuse for it. Uh, other than companies are nervous about you know, putting money on fresh talent. So the, the strategy that we did, and we worked with uh, Women in View, which is an organization that's uh, trying to change those numbers, uh, is we created a mentorship program that actually ends up with a job versus I think mentorship programs that currently exist where you do a mentorship and you never get hired. You do, we have so many female directors, women directors approach us and been like, I've shadowed on, on eight different shows, but that's not helpful. So what we did, and I understand from a production point of view, you wanna be careful, your budget of a TV show is 300,000, you don't wanna put that in anyone's uh, new hands. So we partnered them with an established director, so one of ours that we had worked with for a while, they would shadow that director as they do. We typically do three episodes in a three or four episodes in a block. They would shadow for three, and then they would get a chance to do their episode. And that director, the mentor director, would be there in the background to assist them if they hit something that was a challenge or they needed some advice. But they weren't meant to speak. They were just there to be like, okay, here's a, here's a way to work out of a, work out your way out of a problem. We did three women uh, new directors on Odd Squad. They were phenomenal. They netted out some of our best episodes. Those three now are continuing to work on Dine and Dana. We're gonna do that program again. Those three women directors are now going to become the new mentors for the new mentees. And they were spectacular. So it's like, you know, every time, it's just, you know, it's just giving people a shot, truthfully, and, and, and looking to see what they can do. Like, they, they did shots that were so innovative, it was spectacular. And I think to some degree, you know, I'm not like I said, everyone was happy, it was all good. <laughs> but, but you do, you know, like there's, there's this massive, um, group coming up that just needs a chance to break through. I worry a little bit about our system because it's exec producer heavy, uh, that all of this creative goes into these companies and they kind of uh, you know, manage it the same way they would manage any show. And it really kind of stifles creativity. For me, the, the, the danger of Canada right now is where are the new production companies? Why do we still have the same group? If Sinking Ship is one of the newest ones and we're 12 years old, that's sad. 
Every writer should have their own production company and be forging their way because then you have that control. Then you're speaking with the network so that when you pitch your next show, the network's like, oh, I know who you are, not, oh, I think I saw you in a meeting once and you weren't allowed to speak. You've touched on a couple of things that, I, that I'm curious about. Okay. One is, who's out doing the pitching? Who has the, who has the, who, who has the context to get you in to see these broadcasters? Sure. And, then the, and the second part is, where's the money coming from? Sure. Are, you, are you relying on tax credits? Are you into the traditional forms of financing associated with Canadian film, Canadian television? Sure. So I don't pitch. It's a great question. Uh, because of getting access to networks is hard. I don't pitch. We email those off. And it's for them to, to watch it. Now, our I think I said our, our fastest pickup is 24 hours. Um, let, let it speak for itself. If I wrote a script, I would have to go pitch it and be like, you know, trust me to do this. This is, see it, know our track record now, and off you go. But we were you know, submitting those things well before. Now, if you like it, I can come in and wax poetic about why I think this show is going to be great. But if, if, if you're like on the fence, it's not worth my time. So it's, I don't want people to, be, to, to invest in us as people. I want them to invest in the concepts and what we can achieve. And I think to some degree we have this problem where it's you know, dynamic personalities that don't necessarily, you know, do they deliver should be the big question. And it should be the question for any new creative that's going to any production company. What have they done? What have they done that's, that, that shows why you would want to be there? Just having a production company say yes is just like having a network say we'll develop it. It doesn't mean anything if they're not the ones that can actually achieve that vision and go further. So be a little bit more discerning. Just having someone say yes to your idea, though great, is not, is not the beginning of the battle. You know, it's, it, it's just the, the start of it. On the tax credit front, we're certainly supportive, but you know, if you look at Sinking Ship's model, we cheaply work with TVO, right? which is a small provincial network who offers some of the lowest license fees, right? Because they just don't have the money. What they balance that with is ridiculous creative freedom, right? What a company like mine thrives on is that freedom. We take that freedom, we go to the US, and the US is like, oh my god, we've never seen anything like this come out of Canada, because we're allowed to. And so I would much rather go with companies that have a little less money, take that and get a ton of, you know, not a ton, but enough money from the U.S. to bring into it. And now suddenly every single one of our shows is airing in the U.S. and Canada and 100 countries. But it is, you need a supportive partner that's going to let you do the things that you want to do and let you push the barrier and risk. If the risk is low for TVO, they're going to say, yeah, go for it. This is Daniel Cook, give it a shot. You know, it's, it's for them like $40,000, what does it matter? You know, so it is, it has to, you have to find those people that are willing to go down that rabbit hole with you, uh, because otherwise you're just gonna slowly pull down your idea until it's bland and won't stand out. But you do have to fight that, and the way to fight that is to show it. Have them, go take it, show it to your kid. Like I say that all the time, you know, please take it home, show it to your kid, see what they say. More often than not, they're like, oh, they wanna know, okay, they come to tech and they see the dinosaur, like it, it just keeps going because you've given them something to respond to that hopefully has a little heart or gets them a little nervous. You know, we don't do any show that we're not terrified of making. You know, if we're not terrified of it, that we haven't pushed it far enough, we haven't uh, te uh, tried new technology that we've never done before, we haven't done a stunt sequence or gone further afield, every single season we try to challenge both the last season of the show that we did and every subsequent show so that it's the best thing. Because I do believe, you know, you should only be as good as the last thing you made, not something that was notable 12 years ago. Although this is different. Yeah, <laughs> All right, good. Oh, there. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Is this on? Yeah. Oh my God, how awesome was that? Can we please say? success stories that I think should be lauded way more often than not here in Canada. And I'm very pleased to be following him um, and Sinking Ship in particular because um, really what I want to talk about are three things which JJ uh, essentially um, spoke of, um, but in, in, a, in, in sort of 
in the exemplification that he used in terms of the work that he's done. I don't even know if that's a word. <laughs> Where he exemplified the, my points using his work. That's what I meant. And the three things that I want to talk about really is um, accountability, authenticity, and differentiated value. Okay? So keep those words in mind as I go through this presentation because Really what we're being asked of today as the Creative Trailblazers section is how do independent thinkers or trailblazers or creative people think about notions of discoverability? Um, what do we, uh, what are our sort of secret sauce, et cetera? And um, how can we then parlay these insights into um, a broader base of issues which may be public policy, et cetera, associated with discoverability as well? Okay, so um, so I'd like to kind of also preface this talk, sorry, so many prefaces, but um, I have this can talk that I typically do around this notion, but um, I'm actually gonna try something new, <laughs> um, also inspired by what we saw previously to, the, to my talk. One is um, to really sort of frame what I've uh, put together in the context of what's been happening in the past month. Okay, the context being that we have this incredible woman, Catherine, um, I, I, I'm afraid I forgot her last name, if someone can shout it out from the audience, that was great, who came up and talked about her experience at the CBC with the Gameshi issue. We have um, this terrible president in the Philippines, Duterte who, Duterte, who just got elected. We have an American political election sort of uh, activity going on that's totally ridiculous. Um, and there's all this stuff that's going on um, right now that actually has material context to what we're talking about today. And I want to bring in some of those thoughts that I've had in terms of um, what's going on in this digital networked environment and society that we've created. Um, mash that up with the amazing stuff that's going on with really uh, accountable, authentic, um, creative people who, who understand differentiated value and then frame it in terms of this broader idea of discoverability, okay? So sinking ship is like Cirque du Soleil. This is what this, this um, uh, picture is all about. And when you think of Cirque du Soleil, you can say, uh, you can call them all sorts of different things, innovative, um, circus, um, uh, you know, a new product and service, but two guys called um, Kim and Mo Mulburn um, in their Blue Ocean Strategy book use them as their best practice kind of um, example to talk about a whole new way of thinking about business, okay? And the business that they're talking about is this Blue Ocean Strategy approach where you take essentially a core um, uh, a business model and you look at what could be eliminated from that particular corporation reduced, raised, or create. In the case of Cirque du Soleil, um, what they did in terms of what makes a circus a circus is they some of the things that they eliminated from circusness are notions of star performers, aisle concessions, animal shows, etc. And what they did was then they brought up things that were totally new, like a theme or a unique venue or artistic music and dance. So this became part of this model that these guys talked about, which is the Blue Ocean Strategy, which is how to create value in a, in a highly competitive market space, okay? So what you're supposed to do um, when you're trying to think of how do I create products and services, in this case, creative content um, in, this, in this attention economy that we're in, um, one of the things that they, they're looking at is to look at these two sets of issues, right? Instead of competing in this existing market, you want to try to create something new. We heard that loud and clear with Sink and Ship. Instead of beating the competition, you make it irrelevant. Um, you don't exploit the existing demand, you capture it. Um, and you make the value cost trade-off, instead you, you break it, and then, um, and, and then you really want to align your whole firm around the, your, the pursuit of your differentiated value proposition, which if can be done also at low cost, which we also heard uh, from the previous example, um, would really position you well. So what this talk today 
is about is this notion of how do we create this whole new market space through differentiation and low cost. So according to the Blue Ocean Strategy folks, that's what they call value innovation. And I think the whole purpose of um, the CRTC Discoverability Summit is really to try to figure out how do we pursue value innovation in the content industry, especially in light of the fact that we're now sitting in an attention economy. Now, I want to pause there for a second because this book was written quite a long time ago, and it was also written in an economic context that's quite a bit different from where we're in today. And some of the things that I'm thinking about right now and haven't quite parsed yet um, so fully, um, but I'd like to share with you and I'd like you to think about, are notions that the, the, the economic context that we're in, where we have a digital society, has changed dramatically. And people s have started to really question whether or not um, we are trying to solve the right types of problems, okay? And what I'm talking about is really this notion that when you have a digital society where you've moved from an industrial kind of economy to one that's knowledge-based economy, perhaps the way we're trying to extract value from our digital products and services aren't really the right ways we should be extracting value. So the book that I'm currently reading and that I'm working, um, uh, whose author I'm working with, is Douglas Rushkoff's Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus. And here he really talks about the fact that most companies are so fixed on extractive growth that they are just kind of like creating value for the sake of growing, and in fact, maybe growing at the expense of um, everything, you know, um, employee satisfaction, um, at the expense of their own um, of their own success, even so, Twitter. He talks a lot about Douglas Rushkoff is a good example of that, where you've got this billion-dollar company that is perceived to be worth nothing because they're 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 not growing as fast as what the the venture capital investment into them um, wants them to be worth. And so there's this kind of this there's this kind of race to the bottom, if you will, when you're only um, impetus is to grow infinitely. So the blue ocean strategy that I'm looking at was really predicated on seeing the economy slightly differently from what it is today, and I think we need to take this idea of value innovation in the content industry and apply it to what we're in now, which is this very uneasy space where we might have an economic infrastructure or economic tools, as Douglas Rushkoff calls them, frameworks that don't fit well into now this digital economy we find ourselves. So in light of that kind of context, um, how do we pursue value innovation? You know, how do we do this? And my, my sort of very specific point today is that it's actually not about discoverability. And if we keep talking about discoverability, we're going to lose the point. Because at the end of the day, and that, this is just one of them, I'm sharing, I, you know, I talked about two other things. It's actually about accountability. So it's about our accountability to ourselves, creators, to our audience um, that we're trying to serve, to investors that we might be beholden to, to the public to whom we are extracting ta tax dollars from, to a government who supports us, to our stakeholders who support us, there's a whole slew of things that we ought to be accountable for, and perhaps that's really the primary focus of how we might innovate our value, or innovate value. So with that in mind, that the notion that we should be focused on is accountable, and I think you heard that from JJ, that's what he talked about. He was completely accountable to the creative vision that, he, that they had, you know? Um, and he was also accountable to the, to the types of content they wanted to create, um, especially in light of the fact that it was kids' content that they were creating, and they wanted to be authentic to that particular experience. And so there's a, a number of ways that creative trail, trailblazers instinctively know this, and so what I'm trying to do is unpack that instinctive um, uh, sort of impetus and try to put a framework around it. So if it's about accountability, how do we 
innovate value? What, what does value innovation mean today? So one, one thing that I want to share is this notion that value innovation today is about finding all the dogs and telling them you're a dog. Okay? And we've heard this talked about basically in the last two days ad nauseum. Niche markets, know your audience, really focus, etc. So this is an old New Yorker car cartoon um, that came out in the early 90s. And if you can't read what it says, it says, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And that how fantastic it was that for the first time we have this medium that actually, where, you know, that, that seemed to level set all the differences between people. Well, today, in fact, what we want is that, and I kind of scratch that out, is on the, the internet, I want all the dogs to know that I'm the dog, right? So that you find the right audience, and I mean, you know, we don't even have to belabor this, but all the YouTubers understand this, that it's really important that you find your audience, that you target them, etc. But what's happened, and this is a, this is a, a presentation I've, that I've done before, so I kind of stop there, but fast forward to today, and my insight is that there's actually another corollary to this, which is on the internet, everyone knows if you used to be a cat. Okay, this is a very important distinction today. And one of the things that I think we can really look at that will help us in the cultural industries um, today is how the American elections have played out. In fact, to me, that is probably the biggest success story as it relates to content production, content engagement, and sort of some kind of call to action, okay? And so uh, this is a guy by the name of Miles Dyer, and he has a Facebook page, he um, has a YouTube uh, page, I don't know if you can read it, but uh, he talks a lot, he's got this, he's a Bernie Sanders supporter, but uh, this particular video is not really about Bernie Sanders, but it's a, it's a way for him to unpack why millennials are, you know, moving to support Bernie Sanders in droves. And I, and I highly urge you guys to watch this video if you haven't seen it yet. It's called Five Reasons Why There is a Path to Victory for Bernie Sanders. And one of the things he talks a lot about is authenticity, okay? So millennials, most of whom live and breathe the internet, are especially good at detecting authenticity, which is a trait associated with integrity. Now, everyone talks about this authenticity thing, and certainly I've sat in enough YouTube sessions where they, that's one of the key kind of, you know, commit top 10 commandments that they give the creators. That you must be authentic, et cetera. And at first I thought, admittedly, I thought, this is such hogwash, you know? Like, how can you be authentic if you're mediated? There's no such thing. But the reality is that I think whether it's true authenticity or perceived authenticity, there is something very powerful about creating that kind of intimate bond between yourself and your audience that was never part of what, what creative content was about before, that it is somehow very, very important now. And perhaps it's the way the platforms have evolved, perhaps it's, um, you know, the, the context of our life right now is, is that much more complex, and so people need that kind of immediate engagement with the, the, contact, the, the content that they consume in, in uh, you know, their mobile and uh, desktop platforms. But whatever it is, it's, it's not something that I can no longer sort of shove aside and not pay attention to. That's something that really does resonate, and we're seeing this in droves, and not just the content that's being created in the cultural sector, but in American politics. So the other part of this authenticity, though, which is, I find, an interesting part, is not only is Miles Dyer saying that authenticity is important, but he says here, we now have the ability to create digital footprints for each candidate, which means we don't have to just listen to what they say, but we can look at what they've done. So that's another thing that's very, very new, which is, you know, if for now, if now you can kind of find the right audience, because now you can find all the dogs, that you're a dog and you want to tell them that you're a dog, it is absolutely clear too that if you were ever a cat, someone will find out. So 
how do we deal with that notion of um, integrity over time or authenticity over time? You know, so if it is sort of a perceived sense of, uh, if, if it's something constructed, which, you know, for the most part it probably is, then we need to think of that construction in terms of the long tail. And that's a very difficult thing, I think, for content creators to potentially understand, especially if you think about the work that you're doing as from being from project to project. Again, which is why, you know, serendipitously, it was a it was a genius move to put sinking ship before my talk because he even talked about that, which is this notion that they took that initial idea of um, this is Daniel Cook and they grew that over time so that people could see that they were committed to that vision of um, this, you know, the growth of this boy throughout the different works that they've done. But this is something super new. So when you're thinking about um, this value innovation around this notion of authenticity and digital footprints, um, what are some of the tools that you might want to use to really figure out where to find your audiences? So I think one of the, the pieces in our toolkit that we need to start really focusing on are audience finders. And I'm just going to whip through these because most of you probably know what they are already. Um, Sarah Diamond, who was here yesterday, actually alerted us to Alert TV. So this is a company um, in Vancouver um, run by Moira Roger, Magnify Digital. So she's got a very powerful platform that helps people determine um, exactly where the audiences live, on which platforms, and how to target them, etc. We have companies like, um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget what this company is called. Uh, can someone read that? I don't know. Newswhip, which is essentially um, a social listening tool that uh, sort of reads all of the, the data um, from all the social feeds um, and then parses it off into a, a set of dashboard analytics. And you can also plug it in um, into an API on your system so that you can really kind of uh, separate the wheat from the chaff. So audience finders, there's a ton of them. These are just a couple examples. These are tools now we need to have in our toolkit. Um, point of view generators are also very important because um, when we're trying to create sort of this niche message or this authentic message and we want to ensure that we have the type of um, longevity of digital footprint that we're trying to create, then part of what is required is for us to really understand how to, how to generate points of view. Um, this example that I have is kind of interesting because it's not a tool necessarily, but it's something that's being used often um, by a variety of brands. And used in the cultural context, we see it as using influencer marketing to you know, lend that halo effect of point of view to whatever it is that you're creating. Used in the Filipino elections, um, this is Mocha Girls, which is this um, dance troupe that essentially became the voice on Facebook for President Duterte. So this was one of the key issues that he, key, key tools that he used to gain popularity amongst the, amongst the, uh, uh, the, the, the large masses who ended up voting for him, 38% of which ended up voting for him. So this is an interesting <laughs> turn of events, you know? So if a guy from Davao, Mayor of Davao in the Philippines is using Facebook, um, using an influencer on Facebook to push his agenda and social message and have that halo effect um, affect the outcome of one country's election, this notion of discoverability has jumped the shark. You know, people know how to use this stuff. This, is, this should not be something that's a surprise to us. So hence, this is why I'm saying discoverability is so old school. It's about accountability. So how can we make sure, if anyone can use these tools in this manner, how do we, as creators, as public policy makers, as governments, um, start to reframe this new digital economy or the, the kind of digital networks that are being created and the, types of, the type of society that we now find ourselves in, in such a way that there's a, there's a sense of accountability in everything that we do, okay? So the next thing that, that uh, can kind of help in terms of how we innovate, how we do value innovation is what I call by closing the immersion loop. 
Um, for so long, you know, we've thought of traditional cultural content as being immersive, books, films, etc. It's absolutely clear that immersion now includes participation. Again, it's not even, a, you know, like we've had Big Brother for a whole time. We have Bell running ad, adverti, you know, branded, adver, ad, uh, branded entertainment um, advertisement on their shows um, with Rogue Shark. So how do we, uh, uh, you know, how do we start thinking differently about this notion of participatory um, design of cultural products? And I think the next stage that's happening is what I'm calling engagement engines. So now it's no longer about the question of do we do this, do we make interactive participatory content? It's like how do we do it faster, cheaper, better, etc. And so again, th there's a bunch of tools out there. Um, this is a, a, a Apester, which is used by a whole bunch of brands, which essentially just creates these embeddable interactive widgets um, that allows people to do polling and um, uh, surveys and, and, some, and any kind of interactive content on your site. Um, this is an interesting um, uh, startup that we support in our Idea Boost Digital Engineering Accelerator called Video Gammy. So Video Gammy essentially uh, takes the esports market, which is a totally different um, market already. These are people who play video games, stream them live, on, stream them online, and then thousands and thousands and thousands of people watch them. 50% of male millennials will be watching Twitch this month. Okay, so that's how big the numbers are. So what Video Gammy does is they uh, have an algorithm that clips the highlights of these hours of streams, and they let uh, your, con you know, your average Joe consumer to essentially take those clips and then uh, you know, annotate it and then post it, etc. So there's all these new engagement engines that are being created um, because we, you know, we don't even have to talk about whether or not participation is a value. Now it's like, how do we get participation um, faster, cheaper, and 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 um, in, you know, uh, absorbed in the workflows of our companies? Um, value innovation by going direct. I think this is a massive um, piece of the. Uh, cultural economic engine that is largely undiscussed. So this is where essentially people are just gonna go straight to consumers to pay for the stuff that they're creating. It's still fairly new because um, it's just starting, but I think there's going to be a, a lot of um, creators who are just going to bypass the intermediaries directly. So this particular website is the Young Turks Network. They're one of the fastest growing news network on YouTube. Um, it's run by a very, uh, uh, you know, a very aggressive Turk by the name of Cenk Agir. And uh, the way they basically finance their entire news network is through subscription. So you join and you're a member. They also obviously have merchandise. Um, of course, everyone uh, has heard of Patreon, so this is, a, this is essentially recurring revenues for artists that you can then sign up on. So if you're a YouTuber, you may decide not to go and sign up with an MCN, but instead get a Patreon account or a license so that you can just uh, generate revenues from your fan base. Um, value innovation through material needs. So, this is, again, one of the, the shift where digital ha has become so pervasive and it's become so part of our lives that, in fact, the value is being created outside of the digital kind of spaces, okay? So I'm just going to pass this through. So uh, obviously, we've done a bunch of work in this area by developing um, pro projects that generate physical products. So this is a, an interactive, uh, an award-winning interactive narrative um, project that we did starring David Cronenberg that resulted in a physical object called the pod being printed. And so, um, so there's, there's that kind of artistic expression of what I'm talking about, but then the other part of what I'm talking about is just the pure kind of commercial um, mechanics of how people are making uh, more money in terms of the, the kind of physical experiences rather than the digital experiences. And you know, escape rate, the, the escape game rooms are an example of this. 
So this is uh, a whole new breed of um, sort of participatory theater experiences that are cropping up all over the place across North America. Um, the ones in Toronto are, you can't buy a ticket the moment they, an escape room goes up, it's sold out. Um, so brands are starting to look at how do they extend um, their experiences into these physical games that people play, so it's participatory, but it's also live and it's ticketed, that will allow them to um, uh, monetize their properties further. And then today, we have CBC announcing that um, Live Nation and um, Next VR are streaming the first ever live VR concerts. So again, the liveness, the, what VR has, is accommodating for us is this whole new other product, which is a new point of view within live environments that they can then start to ticket, right? So in a theater, you've got, you've got uh, you're limited by the number of seats you can sell with live VR, what you can do is you can actually put a camera where the basketball net is, for example, and then all of a sudden that, that net view becomes the most valuable property and can also command the highest price. And that's essentially replicable across whomever is interested in doing that, increasing the value of that experience exponentially. Um, and then we've t heard people talk about VR, but I really see it as more than just VR. It's about um, innovating by colonizing space. Digital needs to come out of the screen because the screen, you know, again, it's, it's this, it's this um, need to uh, find more ways to monetize itself, I suppose. Um, so, you know, you've got AR engines, you've got <coughs> headsets that, be, that are being created. This is part of what we did with the Google Glass. And of course, you've got um, um, VR coming out in commercial mainstream this year. Uh, what's really needed are accessible platforms. So uh, although you have the Google Cardboard and you've got, which is arguably zero dollars or at least two dollars, et cetera, and you've got the higher end systems like the HTC Vive, there aren't really that many authoring tool platforms that are being created to make it accessible for any content creator to create VR. We're helping one of these um, accessible platform companies through our Idea Boost um, uh, accelerator. They're called Pinch VR, so they're developing a whole new kind of um, way to create uh, and publish VR content and also allow for interactivity to happen in mobile VR. Um, and then last but not least, it's really about um, being able to fail faster than the incumbents. Again, JJ kind of spoke about this where he talked about the need to de do their own development, the need to finance that themselves so that they can then um, they can then have control over it and can move on if they can't find the right market for that. Um, and I'm just sort of rushing through this whole thing. Uh, so yeah, so we, we do a lot of experiments. This is our Google Labs that we did in San Francisco. We do a, a whole bunch of um, uh, sort of not just prototyping of products, but also prototyping of business models. This is the business model canvas that we use often, or the value um, innovation canvas that we use. Um, and really what you need as a toolkit for that, in terms of that value innovation of failing faster than incumbents, is what you need are nimble media creators. And I think that's what we want to promote as policymakers and as the government, is how do we create a culture where we're actually building more JJs. <laughs> Um, so I'll end there, and maybe I'll ask you to come and, and step up and stand with me in case there might be any questions. So my thing, I, I hope it, I kind of rushed through this because I know we didn't have time, but my whole thing is really around the, the three points that I want to make are the following. One is forget about discoverability because we've moved beyond that. Sorry, Jean Pierre. Okay, um, Jean Pierre, Jean Pierre, that's Jean Pierre. Sorry. Uh, the second thing that I think we need to be really uh, um, uh, um, mindful of is that it is about accountability. It is about our need to connect authentically with our audiences. And it is, it is about the need to have a differentiated value proposition because we live in this attention economy that is increasingly becoming difficult to navigate. And so unless you have um, all of those three things, I think it's going to be very hard to compete 
Um, not to mention the fact that we're also trying to, to compete in a space where uh, we're really trying to figure out where to go in terms of this extractive growth model versus really trying to finally find a more um, appropriate economic model than the current one we have now. So thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Thanks, Anna. That was great. Um, so a lot of what you talked about um, sounds like you're kind of looking the next phase of, of media creation. If you think about, I mean, I map this on to some of my thinking. I look thinking about Christensen and disruption and looking at how the actual product changes when you're changing the technology. So how do some of these, you know, toolkit items that you talk about apply to people who are still thinking in terms of creating <coughs> the next best series that's going to be as good or better than Game of Thrones or some of the Netflix originals, which is really still just old world, yeah, yeah. Old world thinking. Um, there seems to be a sense of you're drawing a, a boundary, or some kind of a boundary between old product and new product, but where does that old product fit in this? That's world? a great question. So I should, probably should have predicated this talk by saying there will always be a space for blockbuster, well, let's call it high premium blockbuster items. Um, I think we can't really escape the fact that um, you know money will talk in many, many instances. So if you've got the star power, if you've got um, a boatload of, of money for marketing and for promoting a product, and you've got a boatload for production, then there is uh, always going to be a place for that. Um, the, the reality, though, is that in Canada, we don't have those same dollars. So we need to figure out how to compete um, with, the, with the limited resources that we do have. And so within those limited resources, I think it's important for us to then figure out what that differentiated proposition might be. And I think it's about always thinking a little bit ahead of everyone else in terms of what might be coming down the road and having not just the ability to be an early adopter in that space, but to have the staying power to stay there until such point that the market catches up with you. And I think there's a number of different government mechanisms and um, sort of uh, NGO mechanisms that help support either that ability to move into that space and or that ability to stay in that space until the market catch up, catches up with you, which makes Canada a very, very compelling um, environment to be in. Yeah. Hi, hi, Anna. Really brilliant talk and, and lots of fun. Um, but, but I want to go back to the question of authenticity because I, I'm somewhat uncomfortable with it. I mean, I, I get the, you know, if you ever were a cat, you may be discovered, but if you look at the construction of a Donald Trump, I mean, there's, there's a way where, you know, history does not follow. So Trump's been able to, in a sense, construct a whole other identity that is not rooted in history. So um, it, you know, in a sort of um, Baudrillardian sense, it's the performance of authenticity yeah. that um, we're talking about. And I think we have to be really very cautious about that. It's, that it's, it's the ability to produce that sort of sentiment um, rather than to be able to have the veracity of authenticity. I, I totally agree it's with you. It's an ethical challenge. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And that's why I started with the notion of accountability because I do think that we are now in the space where um, whether that's the, perform, the performance of authenticity or true authenticity is privileged by the technologies that we've created and then the user behaviors that have come out of those technologies, so that now, like that's done, like it's baked, it's done. We, and we know it's done because of the results of the things that I spoke about, you know? So in a weird way, that's why I'm saying, in, you know, in, in light of this, what, where does accountability play a role and what does that actually mean? So it's not about discovering those people any longer, it's about how do we make ourselves accountable for that kind of um, potential exploitation of both the technologies and the user behaviors 
who have grown up with those technologies. So, so I think this is a really um, in, interesting and important conversation in the Canadian context where there, um, there are public broadcasters, there is a public broadcaster, there is a public space, um, there is a film board. And that dialogue about you know, sustaining a space of um, authenticity and public discourse and what kind of investment um, and projects go into that space that are meaningful is very different from the US and other jurisdictions where there isn't a public space that, that requires some level of, um, in a sense, protection. Yeah. Um, so yeah. as, this, as we continue the conversation, I mean, I think it's been very important for us to be clear about what is you know, purely um, subject to the market yeah. Uh, you know, with the various supports that we can put in place, and like what kinds of fences we put around other kinds of discourses and spaces yeah. around accountability. Yeah, and I guess that's why I'm also saying by re sort of framing the conversation away from discoverability, which flattens everything out, to the notion of accountability, which then allows for the nuances of well, there are different types of accountability if you're talking about the public versus the market versus your audience versus your investors, then that, that becomes a much more nuanced conversation. Great, thank you very much.